I always thought the game should have been called Jet Set F Willy, quite honestly. I properly loved it in the early days of 8-bit gaming, but equally hated it at the same time. The sheer size of it compared to its predecessor, Manic Miner, just blew my tiny mind. A great deal of the joy the game brought me was simply finding new rooms to explore, but also ultimately finding new ways to die and be frustrated enough to turn it off and go and play something else. Ridiculously, all this happened pretty much exactly 40 years ago, as I'm pretty sure Jet Set Willy was released around mid to late March in 1984. This is backed up by the first review of the game in the 29th of March edition of Personal Computer Weekly, and the new entry straight in at number 5, the game made in the following week's game chart, as compiled by WH Smith no less. The game is one of those everyone should play it once before they die types, as it really epitomises those early heady days of 8-bit bedroom coders. A much anticipated follow-up to Matthew Smith's only other game of note, Manic Miner, it took everything that was bloody brilliant with that game and turned it up more than a notch. The press and public alike lapped it up, and still all these years on, thanks to the availability of the game design engines that make this one of the most modded games out there, it is still played a great deal today. After Manic Miner took only 8 weeks to knock out its much smaller amount of screens, the same did not apply to Jet Set Willy. Having broken away from the publisher Bugbyte to start up a new publishing house called Software Projects, there were certainly more stresses on the troubled teenager to get the follow-up game to market. With all the distractions and issues Matthew Smith had with releasing the game, it certainly fell victim to a big lack of quality assurance. This meant there were bugs aplenty with three pretty big ones that all contributed to making the game unfinishable. The biggest and most memorable of these bugs was of course the attic one. A second arrow that never appears in screen, which in technical terms I don't understand, has an odd value rather than an even one in the screen buffer addresses or something, and rather than fly across the screen, it flies through the code ripping out bits of the game in various locations. Software projects tried to put various spins on this bug, claiming it was all part of the fun and the challenge. Crash Magazine in their tips page even remarked that the feature had been built into the game to make life more difficult, the object being to close off most of the routes back to bed. Once the attic had been visited, a chain reaction sets in, causing loss of lives in the aforementioned rooms, and causing the guardians in the chapel and some other locations to move, ostensibly, to the killing grounds where you lose all your lives. Consequently, visiting the attic should be left to the very last, and having been there, the obvious easy route back through the kitchens is out of the question. You will have to retrace your steps through the banyan tree. Tricky. By the following month, everyone involved had backtracked somewhat with Crash submitting the pokes needed to fix the attic bug and instructions on how to load them. Interestingly, it seems the competition software projects were running on being first to complete the game also helped them fix the bug as the competition winners submitted the pokes that helped them complete the game in the first place. Genius. So, fast forward 40 years, and although I have played the game extensively, I don't think I've ever experienced the bugs. Whether I never got to the attic when I was younger, or had a later revision of the game with the bugs fixed, I'm not so sure. So I thought it was about time I experienced them and see how they broke the game. Now this one is a bastard, because when you first enter this room, nothing seems out of the ordinary. But, believe it or not, there is a collectible item here that in the fixes software projects made, moved the item to the hall, although the item was still invisible. There are some things you can do though to make the item appear and also reachable. These first two pokes make the item visible as a small flashing square, but as you can see, there is still no way of getting to it. So a few more pokes are needed to help us grab it. Exit the room and back in again and boom. We now have a useful ledge to use. Jump the ramp and voila, the item is collected.
Another one that must have driven gamers mad at the time is the inaccessible items seen here in the conservatory roof. The only way to reach these items is from the lower ledge on the next screen under the roof. But as you can see there is no way back down to the ledge with the platforms on the right hand side being accessible from below also. So way back down the house at the banyan tree there is a solid block that needs removing. Enter the poke, walk off and back into the screen and the block has disappeared making it possible to climb up on the right hand side of the tree and onto the ledges under the roof. We are not quite done though as the first item on the right side is still inaccessible so another poke is needed to remove the nasty. Now all the items can possibly be recovered although I'm too crap to show you how that is done. Ah yes, the big one. The one software projects were most aware of and tried to fob off as a feature of the game. When you walk into the attic, all appears fine. It has a big old nasty in here that looks fantastic and the first arrow will ping off as expected. But if you listen out, there is a second arrow noise that doesn't appear. Now I have seen a flash on the left hand side a few times, but no arrow. Some have suggested waiting around in here makes things worse as the arrow continues its journey outside of the screen and into the code. I found that the more I wander around, the worse things get. I have a few pokes going that give me invincibility, so we should be able to see the effect the arrow has on some of the rooms. So back under the roof and you wouldn't suspect a thing. All appears fine here. And notice the orangery here and the west wing are okay too. It's not actually until we get to the kitchens that things go belly up. The nasty chefs are all over the place and Willy is disappearing in places too. The next screen is worse and before I know it I'm whisked back up to the orangery which is now corrupt also. And you'll also notice the time and items collected is now also screwed. I then try to get to the top sections of the house, but ultimately I get stuck. Yeah, it's proper broken here. I can imagine anyone finding this bug and reading that it's supposed to be there would have had major doubts when they restart the game and find things are still strange. If you want to play with the various pokes and issues with the game I'll stick a link in the description to an excellent website that has teardowns of this game and many others. So I think all this shows is if you have one guy working alone on such a massive game under certain time constraints, shit is going to happen. Fortunately, these issues were all easily fixable and the game continues to go down as one of the best and well-loved games of the 8-bit era. Love it or hate it though, it will always be remembered as one of the first games you truly felt you could explore. So many rooms and new things to find made it unlike anything else and for that reason alone, it will always be a classic regardless of its early issues. Right, I'm off to poke Maria so I can relive throwing up before bedtime. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.